Hey everybody, I'm Stryker here at K-Rock, joined by a band who got their start not too far from here. And over the years, 15 top tens, four number ones, eight full-length albums, and they're about to hit up their residency in Las Vegas. You can see them right here next to me. Incubus, guys! <laughs> How's that? I hear the applause. Yeah! We got about seven people in here, so we're going to keep the energy going between us. How is everybody today? <laughs> Great. Feeling good, Yeah, we're man. good. Caffeinated. Are you caffeinated? Yes. Continuing to caffeinate. Nice. I started it off saying you got your start not too far from here. Everyone in the band is from the Calabasas area, but Kilmer, where are you from? Uh, I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I grew up in a little small town called Dillsburg, Pennsylvania, just outside of Harrisburg. It's all Bergs, huh? All the Bergs. You know, Pennsylvania's Berg, Berg, Berg. You grew up in the Bergs. I grew up in the Bergs. Yeah. And now you're an L.A. guy. Yeah, you know, just like everybody else. I just, except for these guys. These are the only guys I know that are L.A. locals. Right. Uh, you know, I just I'm an L.A. Local I came too. out here. And then I met these guys, and the story's over. <laughs> I kicked it off. Later. <laughs> ben, ben our, our bass player, Ben, he, uh, he's, he's from the East Coast also. He's from New Jersey. Ben yeah. joined Incubus in the early 2000s, just after Morning View. 2003. 2003. Yeah. And yes or no on this, and Jose, Ben has been in the band longer than Dirk was in the band. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> crazy. He'd like kind of a he, lot. He really wanted to be here, but he has uh, explosive diarrhea, so he okay. says hello. Uh, <laughs> ben, by the way. About <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, explosive diarrhea. Really explosive He's diarrhea. going to be very happy to know that yeah. that's his reason. That's what happens when you miss here. an interview. <laughs> Sorry, Ben. We have a uh, rule in this band. <laughs> if anyone ever uh, doesn't show up, doesn't matter the circumstance. You could have like a flat tire stuck in traffic, didn't want to come, doesn't matter. You have diarrhea. Okay. When explosive you're not, <laughs> diarrhea. When you're not here. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, I think 14 years he's been in the band now. 2003, so 50, it's for 50, almost, almost 15, 15 years. years. Yeah, wild. Wow. Yeah. And I, what I would have asked him, and he's going to, see this is does he say daily thank god i didn't mess up this operation because <laughs> the pressure i would have felt i remember then was like man yeah this band is so big one of the biggest in the world and now i'm joining them i hope things continue to go well and they've gotten even better well you know well, he came from the roots so yeah he could be thinking oh, i could be on the tonight show right now <laughs> i know sometimes i wonder if like he's like damn it bad yeah. choice no, the, the thing yeah. is with ben is that he he plays every instrument better than every one of us so yeah, it's like he's a trip it's he's he's kind of a he's like a savant he's, a, he's an incredible asset to us to this band creatively but also like he when he joined the band it felt like we were something like locked into place something clicked he mm. i feel like michael if you don't mind me saying so on your behalf i don't found mind like a, a uh a, a technical partner in in bass and guitar that sort of thing happened really beautifully on a record called A Curl After the Murder. And then it just sort of it reinvigorated us again. We've had like moments where we've sort of dipped down and then something happens that kind of sparks creativity again, you know. So Ben was definitely one of those moments. Uh, obviously, none of us are in the band. None of us are on the bus with you guys over all these many years and in the studio. Um, is it just as easy when you go make an album like Eight, the most recent one, in terms of how cohesive you guys are? Or is, every, or is it more difficult to get everybody in the room? Because there's been so much success. You're like, yeah, now let's just do it tomorrow. Jose, what's it like <laughs> for the band? Um, I mean, I think it's once we sort of dedicate time to do it, then everyone's on board and we just go for it. <clears throat> kind of dedicating that time is the hardest part of it. Um, but I think when we get together, I, I mean, you just put us in a room and we just start playing music. We just start writing music. That That's always been something. There's that chemistry that seems to always be there and consistent. Now, formulating that into songs that we're proud of and that, you know, challenge us and push the boundaries of what we do, that's the hard part. But there's that chemistry that we all have that every time we're in a room, it's like we just automatically go which is pretty incredible for us i mean when we gear up to rehearse for a new tour or something we're like already playing around with new material and ideas and we're like old incredible. lovers <laughs> <laughs> well, meeting well, the, at the Wesley arms <laughs> hot tub <laughs> the, the, uh, Spice uh, one of the one of the joys of the continual process of, of making music, writing it, recording it, and all of that is, you know, the, the people that you work with and the 
just the creativity that happens when you bring some new element into it. And for us, uh, working with Sunny uh, Skrillex on this yes. album, that was kind of a, a a reinvigorating thing as well for us. Like, he's just a, a great guy and a really good friend of ours, and and had such a fun unexpected time uh, working together with him wasn't we didn't plan that at all it just happened i know when i was young and i wish i sometimes was able to do this but i do sometimes whatever i said on the radio or maybe how i was on tv i didn't even think i just did it and if it stunk it stunk yeah. and if i had the worst hairstyle in the world then i did and i just <laughs> let it go but now maybe i'm like okay maybe i'm gonna this is gonna wear nicer pants and boots and are you guys uh, more sticklers in the studio and like mess with the songs a little more now or is it actually easier as your more mature brand to let songs go there's no that's a really good question because i think as we get older we get more particular and we get more set in our ways personally and stuff like that but one of the cool things about um this creative family over the years is that um we've been pretty good almost in an unspoken way um uh, to to not put those kind of weights and expectations on each other. They exist already. Like we do it to ourselves in a lot of ways. When we get in a room together, um, it's almost just like here is, it's a, it's a giant sandbox and just dig as far down as you want and see what's down there. And sometimes we get to China and it's awesome. Right. Sometimes we hit a rock bed and there's nothing there. And <laughs> we'll di We've ditched so many songs over the years. There's like probably 50 tracks that are, they exist in the place where the left sock goes to when you can't find it. You know what I'm saying? Right. The beyond section Sock of Bed, Bath yes. and Beyond. Um, uh, but it's not, they're never like, like passed over with, with hard feelings. It's sort of like, that's cool, but it's not as cool. This other thing though is super cool. And so we hyper focus in on particular tracks. All that being said, writing eight was really, really fun. We took like a year to, to write it and record it. And it was really fun. And I've really fond recent memories of it but it was also really really challenging for exactly the reason that you brought up because uh this band has covered so much ground in our almost 27 years that the longer we're a band the the more challenging it becomes to uh find novel territory and that's the whole idea is to discover new sounds and new formulas and things like that so uh but that part of it, and, and I don't know how you guys feel, but I'd love to know your opinion on these things. But that's kind of what also keeps it interesting, is that the longer you're doing it, the more challenging it becomes. In certain ways, it's like you're an expert. We've been doing it. We have like, you know, 100,000 hours invested in this type of a thing. But um, it's an amazing challenge to try and continually stumble onto novel territory. So we worked with uh, Dave Sardi in the first parts of this album, and he was just brutal on me. Hmm. I was like, I did it, man. Check this out. I I'm awesome. He'd be like, <laughs> cool. I don't get it. <laughs> and it was, there was a lot of just like hand slaps forehead moments for me on this record. And uh, I wow. definitely tried harder than I've ever tried. Mm. But what's interesting is it's a lot more kind of like a lot of the songs are much more like simple and uh, like reduced down to places, but it started with like a hundred more lyrics per song. What is something the producer says that he doesn't get it? Are you singing too slow? Are you singing too fast? Are you extending out your words too long? What is it? He challenged me on every front. He challenged the way that I sing. He challenged the way that I write. He challenged uh, a kind of all of us in a certain capacity he would challenge, right? He'd be like, why are you playing so many notes right there, Jose? Like, it sounds cool, but... <laughs> or try this, or try... I mean, he definitely... And, and a lot of times we'd go the complete circle. Okay, the first idea was pretty good. And we tried a hundred things since then. Yeah. He's like, okay, I like the first thing better. And you're yeah. like, oh, you fucking asshole. Okay, cool. <laughs> I love you. It was one of those things where it was like this push-pull. But a lot of times that makes great uh, art, is when right. you have someone that's willing to challenge. Makes you uncomfortable. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. It's like, here, go sleep on that bed of nails and then talk to me in two days. <laughs> oh, it wow. makes you have to think really hard about what you're doing, uh, sometimes too hard. And yeah. it's really up to us, though, to, to decipher uh, what the too hard is. You know, like as, as artists, we have to, ultimately, we have to have the vision for whatever it is that we're doing. And, and a producer is there as a facilitator. I mean, actually, I shouldn't say that. Some, it's, it, it differs from every band, every artist, and every producer with the type of relationship that they have. You know, some producers write all the music and 
envision the whole project for an artist that that happens Wait, all the time we can get a producer that just writes all the songs <laughs> dr luke bring <laughs> yes you can I, uh, I didn't mean to bring that up right now i'm really sorry we'll talk about that later straight really vanilla here yeah we we'll go. talk about that later. okay that sounds good when brandon's not here all right we'll talk about that <laughs> um Brandon, you said it a second ago. Twenty-seven years as a band. We're in our twenty-seven. You, start, you met or you started in like ninety-one, right? In Calabasas. Yeah. As of uh, November, that'll be a full twenty-seven. November, years. I think it's November sixteenth. I I have this little journal entry from when we were in tenth grade in Miss Rosen's English class. We were we sat next to each other in that class, and we would have these little journal journal writing, uh, ten minutes of journal writing at the beginning of each class. And I have this entry where I, I wrote, you know, we started our band. It's called Incubus, blah, blah, blah. That was in 10th grade. 10th grade. Calabasas High. Yep. In the same class. Jose, you went to that same school, right? Sure did. And were you in that class? I was not. So where along the way in 91 did, were you, did you become part of the Incubus plan? Um, well, the summer right before school started, me and Mike started just jamming. He brought over his his stepdad's drum kit. Right. <laughs> it never left. We, we commandeered it. <laughs> yeah, and it never left. And then um, around that time, he had been friends with Alex, our old bass player. So the three of us kind of jammed and just messed around with like covers, you know, just kind of buying time with music. And then um, during the school year, uh, that's, we continue to play, and then, like, pretty much the beginning of the year, Brandon was like, let me join your band. <laughs> Yo, guys, I got long hair. <laughs> we like, were already this whole time. Oh, no, we, we grew up we're together. We were surfing yeah. and skating together and stuff, but uh, I had I, I just gotten the that crappy little PA, right, the second-hand PA. So, of course, I was going to be the singer because I had the PA and long right. hair. <laughs> Is that how it works when you're young? Whoever has the instrument, you just are that. And if you don't have the instrument, you're the singer. Or if you have the PA. Yes. Is that yes. How it goes Honestly, down? Yeah. yes. Jose was. Uh, so, uh, I'm super stoked we're in a band together all these years. But he was the only guy I knew that played drums. He was one of two people I knew that played guitar. Dirk Lance was the only person that we knew that played bass that I knew. And there was, like, one other person that was a singer at our school. I wasn't even a singer, though. I just no. was, like. But I remember though that because like we naked. had we had we had woodshop together. Remember, Mr. <laughs> Baylor's woodshop class. Yeah, and we would sit there and and I remember you were like writing poems and like you know drawing stuff and we were we would talk about it all the time. We talk about music all the time. Mm -hmm. And I remember this was in ninth grade. This is before Incubus started, and we would talk about making music. And um, we never did at that time, but we talked about it so that by the time. Jose and I and uh, Alex started kind of jamming together. It was just sort of like the next logical step was like, oh, you know, Brandon came and they, they, we all just, I don't know. Our first practice yeah. was in my, my mom's living room, remember? And your mom dropped you off. Mm -hmm. And I remember waiting. Before we could drive, we started our band. I remember wow. um, waiting out in front of my mom's house and it was just me and Brandon at this point. The other guys had already left and um, we were like, yeah, this is going to be really cool. Like, <laughs> We're, we're gonna have a band. It's gonna wow. be awesome. We're gonna play at parties and stuff. Like that was our our we're big get goal. Free beer. What were the songs you were playing in those initial practices? Were they only covers? We we played some covers. We were playing um, like some Metallica songs. Primus. I think it was like Megadeth. Um, like uh, for whom the bell tolls by Metallica. Wow. A sanitarium. Like a, a lot of stuff from those like, aren't easy to play. Master puppets. Yeah. Like I think for a lot of guitar players. Um, some of those songs are um, like in the early stages of learning. Some of those songs are, are like at least the basic pieces of them are really good for for young guitar players. Right. Like like uh, Sanitarium by Metallica is an amazing song to like learn how to play. You know, a guitar a guitar part that that is challenging to play, but also something that you can play that sounds really good to your young adolescent um, you know rebellious ear. A lot of the best. Um rock and roll songs that are the most classic rock and roll songs are kind of that way. Think about like Back in Black by ACDC or a couple of riffs, a couple of kinks riffs, you know? It's like stuff that in your first year of guitar you can kind of figure out and then they stoke a further interest in it. So they're like invaluable for what they, not only are they awesome songs, but it also like, it gets kids who are first learning like, I can do it. Yeah. I can rock. <laughs> yeah. Somewhere dad in the next room is like, yeah. Um, yes. No. What was this song? Uh, I think it's "Fade to Black." Actually, 
by Metallica. That was one of the one of the first ones that we really started playing together. And then we started writing songs kind of immediately. Um, I think the first song that we ever wrote was called Love Sick. Sick. Love Sick. Yeah. Did that now? Love sick. Yeah, write a song you're actually doing in the living room. But before you, I get to that actual question. Jose, were your folks a hundred percent cool with this band starting in tenth and eleventh grade and driving you to the house <clears throat> and then coming back and picking you up and you got to schlep the goddamn drums everywhere and all this stuff? I mean, for the most part, yeah. Oh, and I, nice. I was the one schlepping most of the stuff, but uh, you know, they were they were really supportive. I mean, I'd play drums all day long in my room and they never said like, shut the F up. Right. Anything. They just let me play, you know, and that to me was like one of the greatest things they could have done was just let me do what I wanted to do, you know, and leave me alone, mom, <laughs> shredding. <laughs> yeah, so she let me alone. She, she, they left me alone and I was shredding with my friends. <laughs> so 91 it starts, you're in high school. I believe it's maybe four years later before Fungus Among Us comes out, you put out like a two song EP. How in the world did that happen? Who found you? How did you get into a studio? What did you do? Mikey, Brandon, or Jose, take this. So in the back of um, one of the like locals, I think it was LA Weekly, actually. In the back of the LA Weekly, they had these ads for recording studios that you could rent by the hour. And I remember we found one, um, and it was like way out in the valley, you know, like deep valley. You know, like San Fernando. We were, we were past where the Karate Kid lives. Way past, sure. okay. deeper, deeper than Daniel Larusso could okay. have imagined. Um, and we pooled our money together. I remember all of us, like we, we were. We, it was like five dollars, six dollars, like, and we got enough for like four hours of recording. And uh, we booked a session. I remember calling the dude up. There was this guy named Jonas who was our engineer at the at the time, and we recorded those songs um love sick and i don't even remember the names of the other ones well we can probably go back and figure that out bathe um, in my snot wasn't that one of them yeah that was one of them <laughs> made in my snot bathe in my snot yeah better, yes. our 15 year old 16 year old minds were <sighs> quite advanced at the time um i think yeah. my lyrics have basically been on a slow decline <laughs> since then <laughs> uh shandor of the northern people that was my point one. exactly <laughs> that was another one we um yeah, we just rented that studio and we went in there and recorded. And I remember the music sounded so like incredible to me. It was the first time hearing, you, you the know, recordings? yeah, the recording sounded yeah. amazing and there was no singing on it yet. And I, I'll never forget this. Brandon came into the studio and and like basically just had an anxiety attack because full fucking because he was scared. Yeah. You know, like it's a scary moment. I you mean, never hear your voice yep. until you record it and listen to it back. It sounds very different. I'm sure you've heard your voice on the air before, and you're like, who is that guy that sounds vaguely like me, but just a little, like, terrible? Weirder. Right. Oh, my God, that's how I sound? It's like that. Everyone's experienced, like, you hear your voice on a voicemail or yes. something. You're like, yeah. there's that weird guy impersonating me. Um, but I was always, with my crappy PA, was, like, just trying to hear myself beyond, like, the you know the drums and the loud guitar and... I never really heard myself. And we got into that studio and he's like, it's your turn. I was already nervous. Like, whoa, I'm going to lay down some vocals. I got this, man, whatever. And I started singing and then hearing it back. And I was like, no, no, that, that's not me. I'm out of here. And I was like, I tried wanting to escape. It wow. was terrifying. It was wow. fucking terrifying. So what, what was it that got you to the point where F it, I'm going to do it. I'm, it may not sound in my brain how it's sounding. How did yeah. you overcome that? I think I rolled a cigarette. And Mikey came out. Seventeen-year-old really a cigarette. Yeah, awesome. Sixteen. Yeah. 16. Sorry, Dad. Um, right. Mikey, like you came out and you're like, you got this, man. You can do it. And then Alex came out and was like, Yo, man, time's money. <laughs> 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 now or never, dude. <laughs> it was a combination of like this good cop, bad cop thing. And I was like, Ah, ah God. And I just went in there and like, I was like angry. Like the first things, I was like really scared and anxious and kind of angry. And then all of our friends were like, dude, this is bitching, play my party. <laughs> then we started crushing the bar mitzvah circuit. Yeah. <laughs> the angry, is that true? Did you play a bar mitzvah? Val- oh, yeah, man. That's we how we did. first started we making actually, money. We actually, we did play a bar mitzvah for, um, for it was, I just remember there was a, a large group of autistic kids at the bar mitzvah. And we were 16, 17 years old. 
And I remember we got paid like a thousand dollars to play Tim. it. Tim yeah. was our boy, right? It was a, it was a, it was a. We were, we couldn't believe like how big time we were at at that point. But it was actually really fun. We thought it was going to be like really weird. And I remember it ro- it was super weird, but it was really fun. We had a great time. Thousand bucks is a good amount. That was our first paid paid gig right there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Thousand bucks. paid gig pro gig. So af- Jose, after the paid gig, after the bar mitzvah, thousand, which is a great payday for a first. That was gig. like a million dollars. Yeah, exactly. I mean, most bands get maybe like, oh, we'll give you two beers and thirty dollars. Yep, we did that too. Where <laughs> was the first venue in Southern California that you guys played? Oh, Mancini's. Uh, Mancini's was just another dirty bar in <laughs> deep in San Fernando Valley. <laughs> Um, At that time, it was a, a, a spot in the valley where a lot of bands played. It was like kind of a, a, a hotbed for like local music, local bands. And like, you know, the Skeletones used to play there. Yeah, Dirty CD bar. A lot of yeah. like punk and ska music was happening yeah. there. Did, didn't we buy tickets? I think it was pay to play at okay. the time too. Yeah. Um, and, and how but, did you get people there? We had a lot of friends in high school. That was That was like, you know, whenever that because it was like pay to play for a little while and we had no problems getting rid of the tickets and plus we would flyer all the schools around us so even more people would show up but um do you remember jose and i used to hand draw all the flyers and we uh mikey's can i say this story what? when your mom gave uh, you the oh, joy yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. gave michael the joy of sex the book <laughs> <laughs> i don't know uh, if you children out there have ever heard of uh <laughs> The Joy of Sex, but it's like this, it's the manual. It's an educational it's very book. Informative. It's, it's like a- the Kama Sutra for <laughs> Westerners. My mom kind of like, she left it in my room. And like, that, I think that was her way of just kind of being like, here, here, here bees, figure, yeah. figure wow. this out and be responsible. One of these scenarios is going to happen to you soon. <laughs> figure it out. Yeah. Anyway, it's filled with these beautiful illustrations, like really lovely illustrations of <laughs> couples uh, embraced in coitus. <laughs> Forni- <laughs> fornicating. <laughs> fornicating. <laughs> all these amazing different like positions and ideas and, and take your lover by the hand and stroke her hair and all these things. Wow. Jose and I are going through it like, these are rad drawings. So we started photocopying them <laughs> and like peppering them with like bubbles and flowers and kind of mimicking the old San Francisco um, Grateful Dead mm. poster art like... Um, Stanley Mouse and Rick Griffin and stuff like that in our kind of rudimentary drawing style. And then we put Incubus on top of it, <laughs> it on top, you know, like over a couple, like 69ing. And we put them on, we'd, we'd <laughs> photocopy them by the thousands and put them around the neighborhood. So people started showing up like, is this some crazy sex thing, man? <laughs> and it's just us. <laughs> but a lot of people came to the show. That's awesome. Yeah. Moral some. of the story is sex sells. <laughs> sex sells. We got some crazy phone calls from people that were really upset too. Is my, that right? Yeah. Like, I mean, my phone number and like your phone number were on the flyers or I remember if your was yours was but like people would call and leave these crazy messages like how can you put that trash on my car like we would put flyers on people's cars and stuff it was really fun i first heard of incubus i think it was right around 97 or 98 science was out which is officially the second full-length album and we don't have too much time because i know we could talk for two hours but i want to go from fungus among us to science and the style of music that you guys put out changed a hint from those two records. Fair to say? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Who's, was it a conscious decision of the band? Did you have an official record deal at that point? We, we did have an official record deal. Between a Fungus Among Us and, and Science, we got signed to Epic Records. Oh, nice. Um, That's big time. We, we had toured you know, globally um, uh, before starting to record Science. We went to Europe and... and you know played a lot of shows across the u.s and europe but the crazy thing is that everything that's on fungus among us was kind of like the first group of songs we ever wrote ever not just as a band but like ever and then science that was kind of like the second group of songs that we ever wrote Ever and you're still young, so your brains are developing. Your the things you like are developing. So we're not as consciously you're, as you're trying to to do this or do that. It just was like, here's group one song, group one songs, and these are like group two songs. And we didn't have a surplus to choose from. It was like we wrote twelve songs yeah. here. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. Yeah. And same with Make Yourself that came after that, and Morning View that came after that. Those were like they're literally batches of songs that we wrote, and that's 
the per, you know most bands I think or artists get the opportunity to like they have trial and error before they you know put out whatever they're gonna put out we didn't have that like we just whatever we made well, we had it it's just all available on iTunes now <laughs> <laughs> yes it was that's, like, that's the reality it was like science tour for 19 months and then make yourself then tour for 20 months and then morning view tour for you know 24 you know it right. was like that was just our cycle, you know? To answer your question, though, I don't think there was ever a moment where we consciously as a band were like, we really need to make some more commercially viable music. Like, it was, uh, that would be the collective voice of the band making that decision, <laughs> right, right, by the way. Right. Um, we came home after <coughs> touring Science, what seemed like forever. It felt like we were on tour forever on the record. It was really, what, like 18, 19 months, right? Something that was like a that. long That's time. And when you're st you're young still, yeah. you probably hadn't even learned how to do your own laundry at that point. No, for the, the most album part. had been out, and I came in in February, and we February did what year? Kilmore, nineteen ninety eight. All right, so it'll be twenty years coming up for me personally. Congratulations! But I remember we did that year. I thought it was only going out for a week, and it ended up being <laughs> the cycle. You probably did more shows before me as well, but it yeah. was like three hundred and five shows that. Mm -hmm. We did on that cycle. Yeah. 305 shows. You thought you were going to be there a week. They hadn't made album three yet. No. And you're you're in on this at this point then, right? Oh, full, by the way, time? he came on. We were still like schlepping in van and trailer. You know, it was yeah. like, and there was, it's not like there was money to be made, but there was all this cool vibe and potential and stuff like that. That's what was driving us forward. But anyway, my point is, is that we came home and we just started writing like immediately. And the stuff we were writing ended up becoming Make Yourself. So it was like a natural, each record successively has been a very natural evolution for this band. Before I ask about Make Yourself, who, was it your families? How did you figure out what your record deal was gonna be? How'd you know, Jose, I'll go to you first on this. How'd you know what was the right thing to sign? What wasn't the right thing? Because a lot of times when you're young, even when you're old, you're like, I'll sign anything, just give it to me. What was it like f for your experience? Um, well, we met with different labels and we saw, I, I mean, from, what I remember, we kind of, we ended up signing with Immortal, <clears throat> which was, which is part of Epic, part of Sony, and they had a string of bands, Corn being one of them, yes. that we really looked up to, and they were very much grassroots and sort of, you know, kind of charged their own path in the music industry, and we were very much like, that's the direction we want to go. So Immortal was very, like, you know, enticing to us because of that. So they also had, they had seven <clears throat> seconds, too, right? Microphone. Oh. Portal had seven seconds as well. I don't remember who else they had, but it was just... The Urge. They, yeah, they had like a handful of bands, and they were small, but they were still backed by a big label. And we were very much like, that's the direction we want. We want grassroots growing. We have like, you know, a, a long career, hopefully, ahead of us like that. So, and also meeting with a couple other labels, it just seemed right. And talking to our, you know, our lawyer and stuff, you know, we all collectively just thought this, this was the right fit for us, you know. I also, it's a, but it's a crapshoot too, you know. I also, at the time, um, was working at Interscope Records, and I worked for uh, two people that kind of became my mentors: was Tom Wally and, and Jimmy Iovine. Wow! And um, so I got to see a lot of artists get signed. They actually wanted to sign. They actually tried to sign us. Guys, um, Wally and Jimmy Iovine. These are huge. You guys know Iovine, but Tom. Yeah. is huge, 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 and you're working for these guys. Yeah, as a 16-year-old, 17-year-old kid, yes. you know, I was, wow. I was, you know, picking up dry cleaning and taking <laughs> care of, like, coffee runs and junk like that, but um, I got to know those guys really well at that time, and um, I got to see a lot of artists get signed, and I got to know kind of the inner workings, at least, you know, to a certain degree. Um, so just having some baseline for what... You know, you ask the question about like, well, what do we sign or what, what's the appropriate thing to do or whatever. Like we had a good idea of what was kind of happening at that time. So I think for a young band, we had a lot of options and it was a really good position for us to be in. We also weren't looking for, and I remember having these conversations with all you guys, but we weren't looking for the biggest paycheck up front. We knew that if things went well, that that would be something that maybe would come later, but we were looking for something that was more developmental and uh, just a label that was going to really get behind us creatively. And what was amazing about Immortal and Epic for those first couple of records was that there wasn't crazy pressure to produce uh, like radio friendly music. There was really like, we kind of asked just to stay on tour 
and they helped facilitate that, which is kind of amazing. And so we really got to develop as a band in bars and then in small theaters and opening up huge. for Corn 311 um, System Sub of a Down Sublime right? System of a Down we yeah. toured with them so much you know we love those guys they and they had Columbia. a sim they had a similar thing like their music wasn't necessarily commercially viable that's not even a term anymore is it <laughs> those deals don't exist anymore no. you know developmental we get to develop as a labels. band like as 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 songwriters we got to come up through and the, the confidence that way. of playing shows like young bands need to know like the more you're on the road the better you're going to be not only on the road but yeah. when you get in the studio the confidence level yeah. has to just be right up here yeah because if you can perform well under all of the duress and the chaos of traveling in a van like by the time you get into a recording studio you're just like ah Right. This is awesome. The exact opposite from my first experience in a recording studio. Because I had no experience. And I went in there. I was like, I'm terrified. Kill me now. We actually had kind of a dream scenario for a, for a young band. Um, we, we had basically all the record labels pursuing us at one point, and And we had been having these meetings with Epic Records and flying all over the place and meeting with people. And Epic was awesome. They had like Pearl Jam and Rage Against the Machine and all these bands that we grew up listening to. Um, and then the person that we were speaking with at Epic ended up leaving. And then all of a sudden we met Happy Walters and Paul Pontius who worked who, who, you know, Immortal was Happy's label, and they were affiliated with Epic. So when we started talking to them, it was like, oh, we get to have everything that we want. Like, we got to have the, the Epic side of things. And then, you know, Paul and Happy, you know, they signed Corn and were really crushing it with, with them. Like, just, they were changing the way that people looked at rock music at that time, especially. And so it just seemed like a really good pathway for us to follow, and we, and we walked down it. One thing that I love about your guys' story is from like 91 to basically 99, 2000, I mean, you were selling records and people were coming to see you play around the world. But if you add up the radio play you had and the MTV support, it's like negative two. <laughs> it was not there. But you were building this audience, yeah. which sets it up perfect for make yourself, pardon me, yep. and privilege and, and drive. But that still wasn't easy. I want to revisit this on how in the world, pardon me, went from just, eh, it's a song on our record to this is the song where Bill in Iowa knows you and people in the UK now know you. How did that happen? It happened in a really unexpected way, too. It didn't happen um, the way that Satan? it normally happens, I guess. Because we actually released the song as a single. We released the, the second single or first single? It was the first, was first single, single first from single, Make Yourself, okay. but... It was out for like six months and nobody listened to it. it we it were on tour with Primus at the time. Yeah. Which was awesome. Which is cool. Yeah. And we also, we toured with System of a Down. We did that Snowcore tour. And um, Mr. Bungle and Puya. I remember that um, tour. Yeah. I, I don't was that the show. Yeah. And so there was like this funny sequence of events that happened, <clears throat> this chain of events that happened. We, we, we got asked by a radio station, and I can't remember for the life of me now which one it was. I believe it was in New Jersey. And they asked if Brandon and I could play an acoustic version of uh, Pardon Me. And we thought that was kind of like, oh, that's weird. <laughs> All right. So we went Why and did it. Why are so weird? We went and did it. But at that time, music was really heavy. Like it was all like corn and limp biscuit and all of like really heavy, aggressive music. Right. So the idea of going and playing an acoustic song for a radio station was that seemed like a really foreign, odd thing to be doing at the time. So we went and did it. And there was a kind of a strong reaction to it. And then another station asked us to do it. So we went and did it. Soon after that, like all, all the other stations started asking if we would go and do it. And, and we couldn't keep up with it. So we then made an EP, which became the When Incubus Attacks EP. It's all just acoustic <laughs> versions of songs on Make Yourself. But then right after that, you guys, K-Rock, started then you you guys started playing pardon me the, the actual original, album right. version and then from there it just you guys started it it all started with you guys so you know thanks thanks Thank you i remember when you guys came in when we were in the burbank building and you played 
Pardon Me Acoustic, but then we set up all through that little studio, yep. and you guys did Stellar as well. Do you remember, Kilmore? You were, you were in the hallway, yeah. kind of mixing really like, Stellar. Yep. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. We were, we before that, I was used to that, by the way, because before that, when we were touring in the van and trailers, the stages were so small that I was usually off the stage, sometimes up in the balcony, sometimes <laughs> in the front with the fans or whatever. So that was normal for me. But uh, yeah, man, I, it's messed up, man. I'm sorry. Hey, man, anything to get the job done. I should have gone off into the balcony. <laughs> well, I, I take up a little more floor space than you oh, do. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And Chris, what what was it like for you jumping in the studio for the first time with these guys for those first two records you in, were involved with? That would be Make Yourself in Morning View. Uh, it was like a, you know, it was like a, just exploring space, I guess I would say. Um, these guys were really cool about it. They, you know, they were songs that they were like, okay, can you do this? Can you, can you fill this spot up or whatever? And their other songs were like, well, here's 16 bars, just do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was kind of whatever. And whatever sounded good, I think, is what we were all trying to achieve anyway. And we were all getting to know each other and we were all, you know, buddy, buddy and everything. So it went, actually for me, it went actually really smoothly. And there was also no real roadmap. We were kind of helping to lay the roadmap for a, a turntablist in a rock and roll band. We were one Absolutely. of just like a small handful of bands that were doing this. And so that was what was cool about it was there were no real rules around it. And Chris is so talented with the turntables that it was sort of easy. It was like, here's, like you said, here's 16 bars, like do something awesome. Yeah. And it would take 30 seconds. <laughs> You'd be like, wow. how about this? <gasps> yeah. Wow. Yeah. My, Go ahead. my only experience with the band was a couple LA local bands that I had just got into, but I was in a battle crew and we would set all our turntables <laughs> up and that was kind of like my band. So it was all DJs. So I never really had that much experience playing with musicians. When did you start playing the piano? Were you playing piano? like? Well, I learned at a young age and then once I figured out the turntables, probably mm -hmm. th 12 or 13, I completely stopped playing every instrument that I knew how to play before. Then when did you start playing the piano uh, Again, I would in our say band. maybe when I hit 35, so maybe maybe even later than that. Was it around Crow? Yeah. 2003? Yeah. yeah. Well, there, there's specifically when digital turntables, uh, digital DJing came out. Yeah. Because instead of getting records and shipping them to the press and then waiting two weeks, I had stuff instantly. Right. And I was using a lot of keyboards to make a lot of those sounds. It was a lot of guitar, Mikey sounds, and a lot of keyboard sounds all affected. And it went from me waiting two weeks to get a vinyl that would wear out instantly and, you know, you'd keep wanting to instantly having it on my computer. So that kind of was a transition where it was like, well, some of these I can still do on the computer, but a lot of these I could start playing. Mm -hmm. So that probably was Crow, yeah, 2003-ish. Incredible about that, though, is that, like, to me, is there was a transition from, it was an unexpected surprise that Chris started to play the keys and started to develop a relationship with, like, guitar pedals and keyboards and Rhodes and Wurlitzers and then Moogs and all these things and it just opened up this whole other dimension to us sonically which is really cool and still doing the turntables <laughs> so yeah. Chris yeah. is sometimes I'm still trying to, to figure it out like the, octop <laughs> the octopus guy he's got like nine eight nine arms uses his hair looks yeah. like yeah. Yeah, right? yeah, that's, that's why I've been growing it out right <laughs> <laughs> So, Pardon Me is huge. Stellar is huge. Now these new fans are like, wait, I want to listen to more uh, songs from these guys, not just the radio songs. They start off with Privilege, which is like, oh, man, Privilege is so good. Then they listen to the old stuff. Things are going great. You're playing huge venues. Everyone that listens to rock music knows Incubus. Now you money is rolling in even more, and you guys get this cool house by Zuma Beach, the Morning View house. Did you ever feel pressure in making that album? Like the expectations were high from people around you. I'm not saying the band had it, but people around you had them. What was that like? Jose, Mike, Brandon, Kilmore? The was, pressure that was, was one of the funnest times. Yeah, I mean, Was it? The pressure was letting the record label get us the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like right. figuring out how we were going to execute this plan of like, you know, a bunch of you know, 20 year old kids or our, we were, we're young, like early twenties, we were yeah. young, um, you know, rent this massive mansion <laughs> on the beach, um, <laughs> squat in a, in a giant Malibu mansion. And it was and really fun to get a record out of it. I that, guarantee it was awesome. they didn't think it was going to happen, but we turned it in early. It was awesome. We, we spent, you know, we spent four, five, about five months writing and recording that album. And, um, it was just, we had a blast. It was like, it was like a creative feast. We, we, we created just, our own little island. 
You know what I mean? Like we kind of, we went there and, and our sole purpose was to make music every single day. So we would wake up, you know, kind of stumble into the living room with coffee and stuff. And sometimes Mike and I would stay up through the night and, and make things. And um, So you took advantage of it professionally as well as, I mean, A, number one professionally, but it was also fun being in the mansion. Did you, you came over? You came over? I was there. Yeah, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was you there. came and partied with us? Yes, it was we, very that was, fun. You know, that was like kind I of I was a, there socially, not professionally. Right. That was kind of, uh, I think, maybe, you know, for all of us, like... It was really just an exciting, fun time where we were being creative. We were writing this music that we wanted to write, but we were also feeling, you know, the success of having sold, you know, a couple million records and being, you know, just being young and irresponsible. And it's right. great. We were, we were very much inspired to write a record, you know. And so every day it was like we'd wake up, eat some food, schlep into the big room and just start <laughs> playing music it was it was an ideal situation i remember one one morning um i had just come back from surfing uh at uh third point and i ran into zach from rage against the machine and he was uh he was eating like we were getting food at the same spot just c had just come out of the water and he, he came up to me and was like hey man i heard you guys rented this house and i didn't know him but i was like you know we're on the same label and I was a big fan and you know he wanted to come over and see the house I was like all right awesome cool follow me up there so we get in the car and we drive up there and I remember I didn't and no one knew you know and so I, I walk in and Zach's with me and I think all these guys were like what the hell is going on here <laughs> like <laughs> is Zach awesome. joining our band <laughs> <laughs> so yeah Brandon we got a new singer <laughs> oh, wow. uh, uh, we were recording strings that day actually which was really funny um, we had like this orchestra that was setting up in the in like the big room, and he came and just hung out with us all day. It was oh, really that's awesome. Yeah, it was wow. really. That was just a good dude. Good surfer too. Is he a good surfer? Yeah. I want to geek out if I may on one song on that album in particular, "Warning." Mm -hmm. One thought that comes to mind when I mention that song title is what a memory from the studio or just something you think about. I'm curious because I love that song. The second I heard it, then to right now, I listen to it nonstop. It's it's a for me, uh, it's an interesting song because uh, it was one, there's usually one or two on the record that just kind of spill out. And I remember when Michael started kind of playing that progression, the, the guitar swells that you hear in the beginning with the beginning vocal, it was kind of immediate. We have a, a song on our new record uh, called Nimble Bastard, which was the same thing. Michael started playing that kind of chugging, detuned guitar riff thing, and it's immediate. Like something just shows up immediately. And so warning, did that for me and it also was um when we were making morning view it was an incredible time it was fun it was beautiful out but i was also kind of um on the heels actually right in the midst of kind of a horrible breakup and so that house was like my it was my island it was like an escape you know and so that song for me reminds me it was sort of like this bittersweet time it was beautiful and fun and exciting all the things that were happening in the band but it was also like this uh there was like a subtext of like um heartbroken you know what i mean and what's interesting too is that sometimes uh the best times in our lives are kind of there's a shadow of the opposite happening at the same time which maybe gives it the opportunity to be the best time because you're kind of trying to turn your your gaze away from something that's not so great but anyway thank you for that answer <laughs> that was awesome um God, we're getting to the end of this, so but there's three things I want to hit. The first is, if you feel comfortable, was there a ton of tension in the band, Jose, before Alex left the band? Was was there, did, was it leading up for years, or was it yeah. more of a? It was. Yeah, I mean, there was. It was pretty obvious that we just weren't meshing, you know, and you know we would have like band talks about how can we rectify this. We're we're brothers, you know, we want to continue doing this together. And it was just obvious that it wasn't going to work. And it was tough, you know, it was a really difficult situation. Um, Alex was in the band for 11 years with us, and we grew up with him, we started the band together. But it just, it wasn't going to work, you know. And so, ultimately, when he left, you know, there was new blood in the band, you know, and that sort of just rejuvenated everything that we did. But it was it was definitely tough, man. And and that breakup was, I think, hard on everyone, even though it was the obvious thing to do. That's not that's not an easy thing to go through, you know. 
Yeah. Uh, something else that, as an outsider, I thought was not easy. After a crow left of the murder is when you guys decided, oh, we have family, I want to go to school, I want to go to art school, I want to explore other things. Was that something that was years in the making, Mike? Natural light grenades. Oh, sorry. Yes, 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 um, yes. You know, all these kinds of things, um, you know, go, for me, you know, going to going to school, um, you know, they're just, they're, they're, they're things that I think everyone, we all recognize as anytime any of us really, like, have a strong inclination to do something, it's probably going to result in um, something positive for what we all do together. You know, if there's like a, like everyone has had different opportunities to like go out and do different things. And it's, it's just a, it's one of the things that keeps us vital, you know, because if you don't and you stop somebody from doing something or, or you put pressure on, on somebody to not do something, it's kind of like, like we're not uh, we're not oppress oppressors <laughs> in this band, you know. Like like the band is the way the way I kind of look at it is like it's going to be there for us our whole lives. Uh, I'm going to be involved with it my whole life, and so if any of us take time away to do something different, um, that's fine. That's cool. And it's like I think that that all of us are better people as a result of whether it's family or, or some artistic pursuit or whatever, those things are really necessary for all of us to become who we are as people. And so we'll do our job better as a result. There's also the danger in any creative outfit um, of becoming too insulated. You can really, like I use the term, like this is like an island, but it can become too much of an island. And we start to like inbreed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Shit I mean, starts to get ugly. Yeah, I mean, it's true. Teeth we start getting all fucked up and, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, that was the first time we took any time off. Yeah. We also just needed to take We'd some time off. We'd never take time off. Like, you know, we were, we would come off the road and write a record. Like we're talking about the, when we were in Morning View House, none of us had any houses yet. Right. We were just tour write a record, tour, write a record, tour, write a record. So that was actually the first time we actually got to stop, take a step back, and breathe a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like it was a needed thing to do to keep it going. I love what you said about the island. And by the way, Light Grenades was a number one album. Yay! It was a number one album, everybody. And then you guys go do your thing. And do you guys feel as strong as ever? Do you feel like maybe the band is only 50% done? Like, right. there is a lot of work to do as a band? Uh, are you talking about at that time or right now? now? Right now, as we sit here in 2018. You know, in 2018, things are really different than they were in 1997 or 19, you know, 2003 or 2008. Um, it changes a lot. Technology has changed everything. Uh, Interest rates fluctuate. Every <laughs> hairstyles change. Bitcoin is up. Bit, yeah, it's it's a totally different world, and it's it's uh, people consume music totally different totally differently than they used to. So um, it's, I don't know, I think that as I've gotten older, uh, my appreciation for all the things that we've done just becomes greater and greater and greater. And like when we can go out and go into, you know, we're going to South Africa for the very first time this year. Um, and you know, India and nice. India, like we melted, we melted down the, the, um, the ticket, whatever the, the place where people buy tickets there. We, 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 melt down their their uh, the servers server. it all, sorry i'm like totally stumbling over my words um we you know that's crazy <laughs> like we're going to south africa for the very first time and, and to a huge crowd you're playing to huge crowds all over the world yeah. and we could sit here and list 15 bands or more that came out in 95 or 2005 that had some success that now can't get people to show up and this and people do for you guys and the new songs are fantastic thanks man thank you of course to answer your question though uh it's never done never done no okay that's what's fun about I it i like it it's just like uh it's constantly in flux it's constantly in process and even if we're performing some of the same songs every night they're never really the same twice I, you know? I feel i feel inspired to want to make more records you know i feel like we're stronger as a band now than we've been in a really long time and that's that's not that's not like taken lightly you know not for myself you know i know we've we've been through ups and downs the entire time you know or you know the last decade it's you know there were some definitely trying times and now i feel like we're stronger the last 
album we put out, my favorite music that we've put out thus far. Like I feel like it's still growing, evolving, and evolving, and I'm excited to like put out records in the future. You know. Well, you guys know I'm fond of you guys as people, and I have loved the band from the second I saw you. And I think I'm going to wrap it up right there. <laughs> thanks, man. Kilmore, Brandon, Mikey, Jose. Ben, you guys, thanks for sitting down and talking. Las Vegas, uh, February 2nd and 3rd at the Hard Rock, and then March 30th and 31st, plus touring all over the world. The yep. new album is eight. Guys, for Incubus, I am Stryker, and that has been our hangout session on leather couches at K-Rock. See you guys. Thanks, Mike, Stryker. You Thank you, guys. Thanks, K-Rock. <laughs>